Good afternoon. This is Alan Gassman, and it is Monday, September 19th at 5.31 p.m. We welcome you to our webinar, What to Do with Both Spouses or Doctors. Our guest star tonight is Lester Perling, a fantastic health care lawyer from the law firm of Broad and Cassell in Fort Lauderdale. You should have the PowerPoint in front of you here, and I'm just going to try to get this done by 5 o'clock for you and start on page 2. On page two, on page two, for you CPAs, for CPAs, CPAs who are watching tonight, I wanted to mention that we have a webinar tomorrow night on drafting durable powers of attorney. Because you have so many clients who have given trusted individuals powers of attorney, and because of the significant changes in the durable power of attorney laws that are going to take place on October 1st, I suggest that you just watch the first five minutes of that. Secondly, we are giving a couple of live seminars one October 6th for the Suncoast Estate Planning Council, another October 17th for the Pinellas County Estate Planning Council on planning with dynasty trusts under the new estate tax law. A splendid time is guaranteed for all. Okay, page three, working with physician married couples. Not always easy, sometimes challenging, always interesting. A few things unique about what happens when you have two physicians married to each other. First, you normally have a pretty good income stream ability. Secondly, they are often both practicing in the community and they have the ability to refer to one another and to work with each other, which has good and bad implications. Third, the creditor protection planning is different if they have common patients because their joint assets that might normally be protected will not always be protected. Fourth, you have a common history of the and future that they're both doctors. They usually met in medical school and continue and want to continue to practice medicine together. And fifth, you have high intelligence and education. Now on page four, you have some risk exposures for these physicians who are married. And number one, there's some regulatory issues, which Lester's going to talk about. Number two, they will often find themselves treating the same patient whether they want to or not. And then there's a concern that that patient might sue both of them, get a judgment, and that that would be enforceable against their tenancy by the entirety's assets. And then third, they both have the financial challenges facing the medical profession right now as far as lost income. And is it time for one of them to go back to law school? All right. Page five. I've noticed a fairly high divorce rate, unfortunately, among the uh, married physician clients. It's not easy to be married in a high-stress type of environment. You've got two very intelligent people, very career-dedicated, and there's a good book called The Medical Marriage, which was uh, highly recommended to me by a very experienced physician. And I read it. It was a, just a fantastic book. It, taught me a lot of things about my own marriage and about physician marriages, so I would definitely check it out. It's published by the American Medical Association. And don't let your babies grow up to be cowboys. If you're a physician, please don't go home to dinner every night and say, oh, don't ever become a doctor. It's so difficult because there's worse professions, believe me. Let your children be proud that you're both physicians. All right, and physicians are goal and career oriented. so. Uh, they don't always have time to make to get their financial affairs organized or to carefully watch for all of their different matters. So as lawyers and CPAs, we really have a duty to do our best and make ourselves available. Now, going to some practice logistics before we introduce Lester. I have a husband and a wife. They're both physicians. Typically, they both have a revocable trust, but it doesn't, tip doesn't usually own very much when they're doctors. Maybe the doctor has a medical practice with two other doctors, the husband here, owns one-third by each doctor. The doctors may also own a building that they lease from. And then the wife may have an independent medical practice. Now, if the wife gets sued in a car accident or because of a prior practice incident before she set up her new PA, the creditor could come and take ownership of her PA away. Or if the husband is sued in a car accident or because of a medical practice incident that happened before he got involved with his new practice, then he may lose those assets. So why wouldn't they, and going to slide eight here, 
why wouldn't husband and wife jointly own the wife's PA as tenants by the entireties, and husband and wife jointly own the building LLC, jointly own the husband's PA, so that in a lawsuit against only one doctor, only one spouse, they wouldn't be looking to lose all of their business assets. Now, this is going to cause some redrafting, and that's why I'm mentioning it here, because I love to do redrafting. Uh, but it really will provide a significant level of protection. That also applies when physicians have invested in ambulatory surgical centers, lithotripy centers, and other types of endeavors that may be safely held separate from their practice, but not safe from a malpractice claim unless they own it jointly as tenants by the entireties with a spouse. Page 9, of course, when you're dealing with a medical practice entity, you want to look at maximizing pension plan contribution, whether you can put children on the payroll to have the children fund their own Roth IRAs and 529 plans, deciding which doctor is the primary wage earner for creditor protection purposes, which I'll cover later on before 6 o'clock, how much you're going to pay in dividends versus wages, whether one spouse can be on the payroll of the other spouse's medical practice entity, rent that might be paid to an entity that's protected as a tenancy by the entireties arrangement, whether you're paying interest to related parties. So we all need to just keep our thinking caps on that when we look at the chart on page 9, we're thinking back to page 8 as to where the wages should flow through for creditor protection purposes, where the dividends should flow through, and, and that type of situation. And going back to page 8 also, and I know Lester's going to talk about this, We've typically had the wife's PA separate from the husband's PA, even if they solely own both of them, because we want to have the accounts receivable protected from one another. We want to have a patient who would sue one spouse not have access to the medical practice assets relating to the other spouse. Uh, all right. Now, page 10, there's Lester Perling. Lester, you're Lester with Perling. us? Lester, you're with us? And I'm here. Excellent. I will let you take it from here to, to complete what you'd like to say tonight. All right, Alan, are you, are you running the uh, slides here? So far. All right, if you could get it off my picture so I don't have to stare at myself. <laughs> I'd much rather look at your diagrams. Um, all right, the issue here is the Florida and the federal, what I'll call prohibitions against self-referral. Um, as probably all of you know by now, or hopefully you do, both federal and Florida law prohibit physicians from referring patients uh, to entities in which they have an ownership interest. Um, on the federal side, there's the Stark Law, and that's what you're seeing now in, in this slide. And you'll notice on in the second bullet point, the first line, it talks about the physician or the immediate family member. And so that's what we're going to concentrate on um, with regard to how that's going to impact separate practices. Um, and we're only going to talk about today um, ownership interests, although it can affect compensation arrangements as well. And maybe at the end, Alan, if we have a minute, I can go into that also, but I know you've got a lot to cover. Um, next slide. So under the federal law, who's a family member, well, obviously the spouse is among all of these other, all these other folk, but today we're going to just talk about the spouse. So let's click on over, Alan. Um, as I mentioned, financial arrangement is at both ownership and compensation. Um, and the compensation arrangement or ownership interest can be through either party, and it essentially implicates then the spouse of that particular physician. Next slide. Referral, and I, I put this up here just because people very often don't understand how broad referral is under under really both these laws. This is the Stark Law definition, and as as you see, it's not it's more than simply um, sending a patient from point A to point B. It includes establishing the plan of care. So that means that if um, the physician establishes the plan of care that an MRI is, you know, or let's say. Let's say we're dealing with a husband and wife. The husband's an internist. The wife's a cardiologist. And the physician, the internist husband, says, I need to send you to see a cardiologist. 
and that patient ends up in the wife's practice, even though the husband didn't say, go to my wife's practice, that could be a problem. And that presents a lot of practical issues about how the wife's practice is necessarily supposed to know that the patient came from the husband's practice, but we're not going to get into that today. That's a whole other can of worms that, will, that applies in all of these situations, no matter whether it's a spouse owning or someone else where there's a financial relationship. So another um, one, Alan, can go ahead. Once the husband, once the husband sa says, you need a cardi, you need to go see a cardiologist, then no matter where the patient goes, if they pick the wife, that's considered a referral by the husband. Under this law, it is yes. Okay. Okay. Which I know is crazy, but that's what it says. Um, all right, you can go on, Alan. To okay. I'm not going to get into this in detail. Because I'm not sure how many of you are in rural areas. But under the Stark Law, anyway, there is a, an exception that you should be aware of for intra-family referrals um, if you're in a rural area. So if you think you're in a rural area, then you know, someone needs to check on that for you. And there's very specific definitions of what is a rural area generally applied to census data. Um, you know, if, if you're in the Tampa Bay area like Allen, or if you're in the Ocala area or Orlando area, there's not many rural areas in, in those parts. But there may be some as you get a little bit more outside of the metropolitan areas, which is something you got to check on, a, on an individual basis. Uh, next slide, Alan. Just for your information, so you remember, here are the designated health services um, under the Stark Law. Now, the Stark Law only applies to designated health services. So if internist husband is sending the wife for a consult to, um, for a cardiology consult, that's not an issue under this law. It will be under Florida law. However, if internist husband is sending the patient to the wife's practice just for a, let's say, an echocardiogram, which is an um, imaging procedure, ultrasound service, then that is a problem. So you need to be aware of what the designated health services are so um, you know where there may be an issue, at least under, under the Stark Law. But because the Florida law is broader, um, Stark Law almost becomes to some degree irrelevant in this regard. All right, Alan, let's move on. OK. Um, penalties, just so you know, here's the penalties for violating the, the Stark Law. Um, Generally, it's primarily enforced by whistleblowers under the False Claims Act, and so that could be the, the most serious risk of violating the Stark Law. And of course, whistleblowers can come from within your own practice, can come from jealous competitors, um, disgruntled former or current employees, um, among other places. So there is a real risk in, in this arena. All right, moving ahead. All right, this is the Florida Patient Self-Referral Act. Um, this law applies only to ownership or invest, investment interests. Um, it does not apply to other uh, compensation type arrangements. The other distinction is that it applies not just to a certain list of designated health services, it applies to any health care item or service. So getting back to the cardiology consult that the husband is sending to the wife, that would fall within any other health care item or service. So as you can see, the Self-Referral Act is broader. It's also broader in the sense that the Stark Law only is applicable to Medicare patients. Florida law is applicable to the patient no matter who's paying the bill. Uh, OK, Alan, next one. Um, as you see here, there's the language, second line from the bottom. It's either directly or indirectly or through an immediate family member um, or through a trust. So if one of the, the creative trusts that Alan sets up happens to own a medical practice um, and the husband works in a separate medical practice, that would be implicated as well. Um, next slide, slide please. Um, we can skip this one that's, that's there if they want to look at it. So here's the immediate family members under the Florida law. As you can see, it's a shorter list, but for our purposes, it still includes the spouse. Next slide. 
Um, these are the designated health services that, um, so for example, um, we've got the diagnostic imaging here again, which includes ultrasound. So if husband sending the patient just for an echo, echocardiogram to wife's practice, um, or an EKG even, which is not a designated health service under Stark, that's an issue. Next slide. Um, but then here, as we see, it, it well, actually don't see, it said earlier, covers any other um, um, health care item or service. Um, a violation of the Stark law constitutes grounds for disciplinary action by the regular, applicable regulatory board uh, and also results in the claim not being a prohibited claim. So if an entity, for example, the wife's practice, submits a claim pursuant to a referral by her husband that's prohibited, um, that's a prohibited and unlawful claim. The law obligates the wife to refund the money to the payer and also at least potentially could form the basis of a false claims case as well. Um, next slide. So we have imputed financial relationships. Well, as we know, and I didn't make slides because we don't have enough time, but there's a lot of exceptions under both laws. Can a, an exception be imputed as well as a financial relationship? And the answer to that question is we're not sure. Um, neither under the Stark Law nor the Self-Referral Act has that um, issue been addressed. However, there is some language in some of the, at least the federal regulatory publications that suggests that a, an exception can be imputed to the um, spouse just like the financial relationship is. That's a pretty complicated legal issue and one that is really going to be fact-based based on the relationship type of relationship and who's being referred to whom for what. So the point in, in going through this today wasn't to analyze particularly when the exceptions would apply, but I did want to make you aware that this is a, a, an itch, potential serious issue and I've run across it now several occasions with spouses who have actually had to adjust how they do business um, in terms of referrals between one another and whether or not they work for separate uh, practice entities. So. No, so, if so let's, you, let's, let's boil this down. You have an internist married to a cardiologist, and the internist says you need to see a cardiologist, but you can't see my husband because it would be against the law if you see my husband. Okay. Is that, I mean, is that what it boils down to? It may, unless under those, under the, relate, in the relationship between those two, there may be an argument that there is an exception that could be imputed to the relationship. As a general matter, being an owner of one practice and an owner of a separate practice, there's likely not going to be an exception that could apply. Um, in financial in compensation arrangements under the Stark Law, which we don't have time to get into, there may be an exception that could be imputed or could apply in those situations. But generally, if, if Dr. Jones, Mr. Dr. Jones owns an internal medicine practice and Mrs. Dr. Jones owns a cardiology practice, then there is not an exception that would allow them to refer patients to each other. So should they merge their practices to be safe? From this perspective, yes. Okay, and then can you tell us what's actually happened in the Medicare audit arena where this has been brought to your attention? It's come up a couple times in audits um, by Medicare contractors, typically not looking specifically for this issue, but it has in fact come up and there haven't been negative consequences from a government perspective um, because generally the auditors aren't bright enough to know what they're looking at, um, but it did result in having to reorganize this, the, the practices of the two spouses. My bigger concern would be if it came up under a False Claims Act scenario uh, with a whistleblower. That's where it's far more likely to come up where you have, let's say, the office manager of one of the physicians gets fired or gets upset with that physician and is aware of these laws, and, and most, many people are now, so you, you can't be say, well, that they would never have heard of it because chances are they may have. That person could become a whistleblower. and really go after both practices. Okay. 
All right, very good. Well, we've got a lot of good CPAs on this call, Lester, so I think they'll make, you know, help make sure that the word's out that when you have two separate practices, there needs to be some degree of analysis and advice to the client to try to limit their exposure in this area. Absolutely. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and head into something simpler called the tax law and go to page 25. I have a sort of a checklist here for some of the things you would want to look at when you're looking at uh, planning for a married couple, whether there's a proper planning structure in place, whether you've reviewed and adjusted ownership and titling, whether you've got appropriate beneficiary designations, whether they have enough life insurance, because if one of them dies, there's going to be a lot of income lost from the income stream. Also, when one of them dies, you're going to have loss of tenancy by the entirety's protection for their joint assets, so we typically like to be able to replace that if the term life insurance is not very expensive. Then, of course, your focus on the asset protection planning, tenants by the entireties, wage and wage accounts, making sure you schedule this for review every two to four years, and protection of the spouse and the next generation by proper trust planning. Now, uh, on page 26, I have just mentioning the protective trust system and how to best have married couple-owned assets. Page 27, we have the chart that almost everybody who's watching here has seen in the past, where typically the husband will have a revocable trust, the wife will have a revocable trust, but if they're practicing physicians, we don't want any assets in their revocable trust. Those are just standby trusts to be funded on death. And then they have their tenancy by the entirety's assets, which should be protected from creditor claims unless somebody's suing both of them. Then they might have an irrevocable trust for the children. And one spouse, the spouse who earns the most, might establish an irrevocable bypass trust for the other spouse. And we're doing quite a few of those this year where clients who have more than a million dollars worth of assets that they can put aside for a rainy day, the husband can make a transfer to a, to a trust for the wife where the wife is the trustee, gets what she needs for health education and maintenance. That trust is never going to be subject to estate tax on the second death. They can use the $5 million temporary gift tax exemption. And that trust will be credit approved from the husband's creditors because he's not a beneficiary and from the wife's creditors because she didn't form it as long as it's drafted properly. So now what are we going to do about the exposure to the joint assets if somebody sues both of them or if one spouse dies and the other is the remainder? Or we can go to page 28 and do a second tier of planning and uh, there you have limited partnerships. One might be a 97% tenancy by the entireties, 3% by a trust for the children, if somebody sues both spouses or one spouse dies, you would have charging order protection on the 97%. So that gives you another layer of protection. In this situation, we may have a, a, a wife who is a doctor but maybe does not have a high-risk practice. Maybe she's a dentist or maybe she's a dermatologist with $3 million in malpractice insurance. She, if we think that she might die first, we would want to fund a bypass trust on her death. So we might put a 96% partnership interest into her revocable trust. Page 29, we have the typical chart that we show clients that explains that on the first death, you can lock up up to $5 million worth of assets if you're lucky enough to die before December 31st, 2012, to benefit the surviving spouse without being subject to estate tax and the surviving spouse's estate. Page 30, just a reminder, especially for those of you who are members of the Clearwater Bar Association, our new book with B&A on the new estate tax law and planning under the new estate tax law is available. And we donated a number of copies to the Clearwater Bar Association. If you buy one, the Clearwater Bar Association receives all 100% of the proceeds. Just let us know if it's of interest. OK, then page 34. Getting back to tenancy by the entirety, so very important for married couples. Did they check the right box when they opened up the joint account agreement? So often they think they did, but they didn't. If you check the wrong box when you open up that account, even if you call it the John and Mary Smith MD TBE account, it's not a TBE account. So everybody has to be very careful with that. Page 32, life insurance and annuities, so many of the married uh, physicians have life insurance and annuities. 
and you want that life insurance to be individually owned by the insured spouse and made payable to a protective trust. You don't want it made payable to the surviving spouse. That needs to be checked. Page 33, one particular mistake we often see is failure to have enough life insurance. A lot of physicians get approached to buy permanent insurance and they see the premiums are high so they don't buy enough. We do have some sample term life insurance premiums here. Our firm does not sell life insurance but we think it's a good idea when a client's in the conference room to give them a general idea that for a, someone age 40, a husband, a 10-year term policy may only cost $500 a year. 30-year term may cost $1,500 a year. Maybe this person would get $4 million of insurance, $1 million at each level. And then the spouse, it's going to be a little bit less usually for a female and for the wife, but also important so that the wife knows that if the wife dies first, those monies go into a trust that protect the, sp the husband and the children from creditors and from the next spouse. So then going to page 36, again we've talked about creditor protection, using LLCs to shield ownership. Our legislature did fix the LLC charging order problem caused by our Supreme Court last year, and a lot of physicians still have PAs or regular corporations or what I call INCs and they may want to convert those into LLCs or PLCs to have charging order protection if they also have multiple owners. Page 37, I've got a one-page chart on understanding creditor protection. Please feel free to use this and to share it with clients. Page 38, more information on tenancy by the entireties and the old Rodney Dangerfield joke, my wife and I were happy for 20 years, then we met. Hopefully that's not the case, but it's very important to protect tenancy by the entirety's assets. Page 43, I talk about wage accounts. A lot of physicians have wage accounts that their wages are paid into. Wages are only protected from creditors if they're paid to the head of household. The head of household is a person who is supporting themselves plus one other person normally who lives with them. You could have two married physicians, one who supports himself and one of the children, one who supports herself and one of the other children. Sometimes it's actually important to segregate money and to segregate wage accounts to make sure this is happening. Other times so often we see wage account situations where the bankers have told the doctors to set up a wage account in order to try to help the doctor but hasn't really given any advice or thought to how the wage account works. Then charging order protection, repair bill, information on page 46. If you want more information on charging orders, please let us know. Page 47, I think I'll end it here since it is 6 o'clock, the cocktail hour. But a lot of married physician clients do not realize the need for making sure they have plenty of umbrella liability insurance. And in particular, a lot of physician clients we find have vacation homes up north. They have boats. They have cars up north, and they buy an umbrella policy, which covers their homeowner policy and covers their Florida driving, and they forget to tell the agent about the northern items. And you have, typically are going to have to have a separate umbrella for properties outside of Florida. So when you get with a physician or you are a physician and you check umbrella policy coverage, you want to make sure that the need for this is addressed and that it's properly covered, and that you have enough underlying coverage, because sometimes the umbrellas will require more than 250,000 coverage, and a lot of physicians are out there not having not enough coverage. I have an umbrella coverage memo here, page 49. I actually have a, a letter that you can fill out for the, the doctor, or the doctor can fill it out and forward it to the insurance agent, and so often the insurance agent calls up and says, oh man, I got the Gassman letter again and here's where the gaps are on this one. Of course, if you use this letter, you probably want, and you're not a lawyer or an accountant, you want to take my name out, put your name in if you're not me. So that, there are other pages. You're welcome to review them at your leisure. If you have any questions, please let me know. Certainly the married physician client is a completely different and separate type of situation from a physician who's married to a non-physician. 
Hopefully tonight's webinar has given you the ability to look at a few of the important angles with respect to this. I thank Lester Perling for all of his help and support for our webinars and also for tonight. Lester, are you still with us? Lester signed off. Don't blame him. I am. Oh, no. there you are. Any other comments for the good before we sign off? No, I think that was a lot of uh, good information packed into a short time, and I'm sure um, it's going to raise a lot of questions. If you've got questions regarding uh, the self-referral laws, just you know, either ask it through Alan or let me know. Okay, Lester, thanks again for all of your help all through the years on all of these issues that we've looked at together, and especially for your help today when I called you at 11 o'clock because a client got called by the FBI and they wanted to interview him. Uh, by the way, if you're listening to this webinar and the FBI calls you and says, I want to interview you, call a lawyer first. Have a great evening.